We are rolling. And we are rolling. We're back. I got both my producers. I spent the longest time since he's been born, which is almost a year away from, I think the longest trip that I'd gone without him was six days for the hunting trip. And this was a 15 day back to backer in Brazil. So producer two, he's starting in the shot and we're just going to see how long he hangs out there for. He'll probably get distracted with the XLR cables. Um, we're going to blame him for unplugging Dan's mic a couple weeks ago. He wasn't even here for it, but he's going to take all the blame. Watch the tripod. <laughs> for those of you who are uh, just listening and not watching, uh, producer two, he's he's mobile and <laughs> he's looking for tripods. But uh, welcome back, everyone, to the road to Paris. Just a quick note before we begin about the production. So I had a bunch of stuff. I was actually in Brazil, in Recife, in Sacarima. Had a bunch of stuff on my phone that I was going to throw in, like a lot of B-roll, behind the scenes stuff. And on Thursday, we were in an Uber. Maybe it was Friday. I uh, We were in an Uber, and it my phone fell out of my pocket. And, well, she has found her resting place in Sacarima, our Uber driver, uh, that's my donation to you. So I've been without a phone. I don't have any of the stuff anymore. I should have the phone in a couple of days. But uh, so it's just going to be me. No production value. I just got in off a flight from. So we flew in from Rio. We took a red eye from Rio to Houston and then Houston to L.A. And anytime you take a red eye after like a 15 day trip, you it feels like you're coming. You're like Robin Williams from Jumanji. where You just come out of their flight. And you're like, what year is it? Uh, it was brand new. No. What year is it? Uh, 1995, remember? 95. That's kind of how I feel right now. So it's just going to be me on this one. No social media stuff uh, from Volleyball World. Just didn't have time to get in touch with them and get this out before we had to start practicing and, and getting this out again. So apologies for that. However, moving on. Sorry for the long intro, everyone. First storyline for the men. We're going to start with the men this week. Goes to Brazil. And I think the Brazilian men's race is over. I am sharpieing in. I've held off on the sharpie for Evandro Goncalves and Arthur Mariano. King Arthur. They are sharpied in. So Evandro and Arthur, they won a gold medal in the Recife Challenge. Took the long road in. Lost to the Capagrosso brothers of Argentina. Marched all the way back. Evandro went full God mode. I've never seen anyone do what he did in Recife. He had 37 aces. So to put that in perspective, number two was Jorge Alayo of Cuba, and I'll touch on them in a bit. He had 15 aces. Number three was Triborn at 14. So Evandro had 22 more aces than number two and had eight more aces than numbers two and three combined. They win a gold medal despite Evandro having what, by his standards, is a lackluster side-out performance. He was siding out at just under 50% for the tournament, atoned for by King Arthur siding out at over 60%. So even when Evandro is having a kind of a, an up-and-down side-out performance, they still win a gold medal. They get their 800 points. They are now sitting at 8,400 points in the race. They're number six, I believe. Let me double-check that. Number six in the Olympic rankings. And then it just feels like this Brazilian race has just been like body blows, jabs, body blows, jabs. And then Evandro and Arthur land a haymaker on Pedro and Guto, who took a ninth. And then the following week in Sakurima, George and Andre do the same thing Evandro and Arthur did. They lose their first round of pool. Lost to Marco Kradger and Florian Burry, who are playing phenomenal volleyball, have so many good wins, just don't have any great results yet. Lose to Marco Kradger, Florian Breer. We get them in the lucky loser. We get taken care of pretty easy. They already knocked out Trev and Theo in pool play. Brutal draw for Trev and Theo to have George and Andre to get out of pool. Same thing as world champs. And then they just march all the way to a gold medal. So there have been four challenges in Brazil in this Olympic race. All four have been won by Brazilian men's teams. Two, so Itapema was won by George and Andre last year. Then Sakurima was Evandro and Arthur. Recife, Evandro, Arthur. Sakurima this time goes to George and Andre. And it, the home court advantage there, it, it can't be denied. It, it's The atmosphere is unbelievable. I absolutely loved Sakurima. It's this sweet little surf town. Hosts one of the biggest events on the WSL every year. Just a really beautiful town. Recife was hot. It was cool. I like Sakurima. I would be willing to go back there for a non-volleyball trip. But Brazil just owns 
Brazil. The home court advantage there is awesome. So Evandro and Arthur sitting at 8,400 points. They are about 400 behind George and Andre. George and Andre are now sitting on 8,840. And so Pedro and Guto, even though they have 7,000 points, they just hit their 12th finish. So this year they've had a first-round quality loss in Doha and then a ninth place in Recife, ninth place in Sakurima. They're now 1840 behind George and Andre, 1400 behind Evandro and Arthur. I'm sharpening them in, Evandro, Arthur. They're going to Paris, and that's not even... The fact that Pedro and Guto have 7,000 points, which is the cut line that I've projected for every other federation except for the Netherlands, U.S., and Brazil, they'd be way in. Like Pedro, it's so fun watching Pedro play, especially in Brazil, because he just commands the crowd. And so it's not even anything against Pedro and Guto. This is just how good Evandro and Arthur have gotten. I'm so impressed with Arthur's improvement. When he was originally picked up by Evandro, a lot of guys were like, that's your your guy, Arthur? You know, the kid who's playing with Pedro, he's pretty good, showed a lot of promise, and now he has delivered. And they're going to be a metal contender compares because Arthur's only getting better and whatever Evandro has done, I mean, he's the six-time server of the year, and he's already, uh, he's pretty much got it locked up year seven, because that was just ridiculous what he did in Recife. So they're going to be dangerous come Paris. Now, storyline number two. So I wrote this out on my flight from Rio to Houston. So I didn't have a notebook, so it's got to go laptop today. But storyline number two, inevitably goes to Chase Budinger and Miles Evans. Now, talk about a team. I mentioned that Arthur was a bit of a surprise. Chase and Miles, I mean, holy cow, have they been a surprise. So when I put up a poll at the beginning of the Olympic race, I asked fans who they thought was going to qualify for the Olympics from the U.S., and I had the Taylors, Try and Kane, Andy Miles, Trev Theo, and other. I didn't even list Chase and Miles. And then here they are after a fourth in Recife, and a fifth in Sakurima, they're now just 80 points behind Trevor and Theo. So as a reminder, they, they were way behind, and they have just marched all the way back, playing fantastic volleyball. I think you know, the world has to start giving Miles Evans a whole lot of credit for how good he's playing. Everyone's saying, oh, chase this, chase that, chase this, chase that. And I think Chase does unlock a lot of what Miles Evans is doing. But Miles is playing fantastic volleyball. And he's got the confidence. He's got the swagger. He knows he belongs out there. They have a lot of good wins. They're playing fantastic. And they're now pretty much neck and neck with Trev and Theo, who have had a tough stretch. So Trev and Theo took a ninth in Recife, pretty much unusable, lost a barn burner to the Bayo brothers, who I will touch on in a bit. And then they didn't break pool in Sakurima. And so Trev and Theo, their entry points are going to be down, but they timed it so well because they're, it doesn't even matter. They're straight into the main draw of Guadalajara, which is next week. They're straight into the main draw of the Tepic Elite 16, which is a huge opportunity because they're the only American team as of now that's straight into the main draw. And then they're straight into the main draw of Shaman. And so by the time that those three events happen, the only event that their entry points going down right now, it's going to matter is the elite 16 in Brasilia, which they wouldn't have been straight into anyway. So Trev and Theo, if they had to pick a time to have a bad stretch, now's the time to do it. Now, as for Triborn and came shock, we, it's so funny because they played, I don't know if they played, we played whatever. Cause I'm their coach played some really good volleyball. Had some good wins, qualified in both tournaments, and these qualifiers are just nasty. They're nasty affairs on both the men and the women's side. The women in Sakurima had two teams from Brazil come out of the qualifier and make it all the way to the semifinals. Sophie Bukovic, Heather Banza came out of the qualifier and took a silver medal. Lithuania's Monica Polakine, Ayn Rop Light, they came out of the qualifier, took a bronze medal. So these qualifiers, like, it's just a seeding thing. It doesn't mean anything. The, the talent is so deep in these qualities. So try and came, they make the main draw, both events, end up taking a fifth in Recife. Their only loss was to Evandro and Arthur in three. Love the way they played. Then they go to Sakurima, qualify, ended up losing our first round match. Probably the worst match we played all year was against Hendrik Moll and Matthias Bernson, who are playing some very high level volleyball. Lose that one. And then we get George and Andre in the lucky loser. And they end up winning the tournament. I mean, you look at George and Andre could have played Cuba, 
Jorge Alayo and Nazlan Diaz in the lucky loser, because both of them were in there, they end up playing in the finals. So that's just the depth of this Beach Pro Tour. So try and came, I think we went eight and three on the trip, which is a pretty dang good record. End up coming away with a fifth and ninth. We are still about 800 points behind in this race. So Chase and Miles are surging up and try and came. We're going to need a podium at some point. But at this point, fifth and above is what's going to be usable. That's what I deem a usable finish. And so they got one. They need about five more in the next eight events. Nine, actually, for Norseka team. So that's something I meant to touch on later, but we're just going to do it now because it came top of mind. So Norseka, which usually runs their finals in the late fall, early winter, typically in December, they have moved it up to mid-May. And so there's going to be a Norseka qualifier on Friday in Manhattan Beach for an all-important Norseka Continental Cup Finals, which is worth the same points as a challenge. And so each federation can send one team. So we're going to have, I would assume Miles Partain and Andy Benish are going to play. Know for a fact that Trev and Theo are going to play. Chase and Miles Evans are going to play. And Try and Cam are going to play. And I, I don't know who the other four teams will be. It's, it's an eight team max, but whoever comes out of that, that is going to be huge for their Olympic hopes because at the Norseka, you're almost guaranteed a semifinal. You got Canada, Sam Schachter, and Dan Deering. You got Cuba. You got us, Mexico's Miguel Sarabia and Gabriel Cruz. They're playing some decent volleyball. And you got decent teams from Puerto Rico. But it's not. It's the easiest challenge level tournament you're going to get. So that could completely change the complexion of the Olympic race for the United States men, especially if Tryon came or Chase and Miles end up winning that. Because that's going to put that could put Chase and Miles over the edge and actually pass Trev and Theo, and it could put Tryon came right back into the thick of it. So that is Friday is you can't understate the importance of that event. Now moving on from the Americans, Adrian Gavira, Pablo Herrera. I've been waiting for the Sharpie for them, just waiting. They had such a hot start. They had a fifth in Doha Elite. They won in La Paz, got a fifth in Itapema, and then. They went cold. But in Soccer Rima, they show some signs of life again. They take a fifth. That's their first decent finish. And by decent, again, meaning fifth or better. That's 600 points or above. It's their first decent finish since the New Valley Challenge in the fall. And that pushes them to 7,640 points. Sharpie, Spain, you're in. Now, the other two teams that are becoming very interesting for a lot of fans are the Bayo brothers of England had them on the podcast when I played an Itapema in the fall of 22 with Tim Brewster. And they've been a team where they've had some really big wins. They beat Alex Brower, Robbie Musin at the European championships last year. And we got four X, the number of podcast views and downloads in that week alone, because people were like, who are Joaquim and Javi Bayo? beaten up on Robbie Mewson and Alex Brower, and then they come out in Recife, take a bronze medal, and then they kind of deflated a little bit, ended up taking, I believe, a 13th in Sakurima. Now, a lot of people asked if, you know, can they make the Olympics? They have very little room for error. They only have eight finishes, and so with eight events left, you need to have probably six, they, they got to have at least six usable finishes. So if, if they don't have six fifth and above, and they're going to need some podiums at some point, they're probably not going to be able to make it on points, but they do have a strong number two team in Freddie Bialikas and Isa Betrain. So they could be a, a decent underdog dark horse contender in the European continental cup. If Freddie and Isa are still playing, I haven't seen them play in quite some time, um, but the Bayos, unlikely to make it in on points, but they have thrown quite a wrench into the Olympic games, into the Olympic race, and they're fun to watch. They jump so dang high. They're so scrappy. No point is ever dead while Joaquim is just running around crazy, getting any dig that Javi happens to get up, and then they just fly. They've played Cuba three times in the last two tournaments, and those matches are must-watch. You should go back, watch those on VBTV. Now, speaking of Cuba, Jorge Alayo and Nazan Diaz, I find them to be in a similar position as the Bayos, where it's unlikely that they're going to make it in on points. 
So right now they're sitting at 4,720 points. They're number 37. No, scratch that. That was the Bayos who are sitting on 4,720 points, number 37. They have 10 finishes. Cuba has 4,900 points. Three of their last four finishes are 760, 760, and 800 for winning gold the North Sega Championship. So they make back-to-back finals, win silver medals in Recife and Soccer Rima. They're number 34 in the Olympic ranks, and just like the Bayos, they just don't, they didn't leave themselves enough time, I don't think, to make it in on points. It's possible. I'm not going to rule them out because they could just make a crazy run through an Elite 16, get a podium, and in a snap, they're going to be at the top, at least in contention. But it's unlikely. It, the odds of our set and betting odds, they'd be pretty low that they will qualify on points. However, Continental Cup, they will be favored. If it goes to a Continental Cup, I would have to favor them over Sam and Dan since they played them in the semi, the quarterfinals of Recife and handled Sam and Dan pretty well in that. They also beat Sam and Dan in the finals of the previous Continental Cup where Sam and Dan took silver. So Cuba, I would say, is a favorite to qualify, but via the Continental Cup. But they're not out of the race, far from out of the race. So that'll do it for the men. So before I move on to the women, we're going to have a little YKO water break, kiddo. Producer 2 is back. Now, if you are looking for a discount for VBTV, code is SANDCAST20. They got all the Olympic qualifiers. They just did an event, uh, an NCAA event at LSU. So good on LSU. And Russell Brock for putting that on. Very cool to see that. So Sandcast 20, that'll get your discount on all VBTV. Don't miss anything of the Olympic race. Now on to the women. First shout-out has to go to our neighbors in Soccer Rima. They had the Airbnb right across from us. Laura Ludwig and Louisa Lippmann. And before I get to anything they did on the court, Laura Ludwig is just a peach of a human being. Just anytime you see her, your day is automatically going to be better. And she mentioned, so they played Puerto Rico in the first round, end up winning in three. And that Puerto Rican team, by the way, is very good. A favorite, a, a high contender to qualify via the Continental Cup, especially depending on what happens with the Canadian women's race. And I'll get to that in a second. But Laura Ludwig, Louisa Littman, counted them out at first. I apologize again. Should have never counted out Laura Ludwig because they take a huge silver medal pretty much negate the big fourth place finish in Recife the week before by Carla Bordra and Sandra Itlinger and now they are up to number 20 in the Olympic rankings and they still have a finish to add they still have a finish to add at number 20 and they're sitting on 6,500 points and so if they just take a fifth in their next event they're going to be over that 7,000 threshold with a number of events to play. I'm, I can't sharpie them in yet, but th- I mean, they are, sh- they're, they're like penciled in. I'm penciling in Laura Ludwig and Louisa Littman. And, and when I saw Ludwig after their Puerto Rico match, she goes, it wasn't pretty. And I said, it doesn't have to be pretty. And she goes, exactly. And their run, as pretty as it looks on BVB, it was up and down. You know, they went to three with Puerto Rico, ended up kind of sneaking out with that win. In the ninth place rounds, they were down, if my memory serves correct, 18-13 to Thailand in the second set after losing the first. And they march all the way back to win that second set, end up winning in three. It's matches like that that can completely change the complexion of this Olympic race. I think often about Trevor and Theo's final round of Pult World Champs, where they beat George and Andre, they end up taking a fourth, getting unbelievable amount of points. If they lose that, This U.S. men's race looks completely different, and this German women's race would look completely different as well if Ludwig and Littmann don't come back from down 18-13 from staring death in the eyes, death in a metaphorical sense for the tournament. But they do come back, end up marching on to the quarterfinals, beat Anouk Verger de Pre and Joanna Mater, end up winning their semifinal, end up taking silver to Chen Xu and Chin Yi Xia. Congratulations to them. They are well sharpied in, as were our previous winners, Tina Gradina and Anastasia Samoylova. Their second win of their partnership was in Recife. So congrats to all the winners. So Ludwig Lippmann, very close to being sharpied in. And Lippmann, she's just phenomenal. And she they're going to be a medal contender should they qualify, and I do think that they will. Because Lippmann's only getting better and better, and Ludwig's only getting in better and better shape after having a, a second kid. 
in Lippmann, so she led the tournament in blocks, led the tournament in aces, and defense travels. And you got one of the best defenders who's ever lived behind you. That's a team that I absolutely love come Paris time. Now, storyline number two for the women. This is getting wild. So while other races are starting to come to an end, like the, I think the Brazilian men's race is pretty much over. I think the German women's race is getting close to over. The Canadian women's race is just getting started. Sophie Bukovic and Heather Bansley, last second partnership, got together middle of last summer. They come out of the qualifier in Recife and take a silver. And then they come out of the qualifier, barely survive the first round match against Savvy Simo and Tony Rodriguez. Barely survived the second round quality match against New Zealand's Alice Zeman and Shauna Polly. They were down 18 15 in the second set. Come back to win that one, win in three. I called them the third, the three set queens because then again in the first round, they beat Thailand in the third set. Of course, they end up taking a fifth. So they added a 760 and a 600. That puts them at number 34 in the Olympic rankings. They have 4,020 points and just eight total finishes. So they still have a lot of work to do to qualify via points because they'll be back in the qualifier in Guadalajara. They'll be back in the qualifier in Tepic if they even get in. They'll be back in the qualifier in Xiamen. Their entry points aren't really even going to take hold until the Brasilia Elite 16. Maybe they'll get in the qualifier, but they're they're just going to be having to come out of qualifiers and make deep runs. And so it, it, it's more likely than not that the Canadian women's race will come down to the Continental Cup between Sophie and Heather and Sarah Pavin and Molly McBain. If they don't qualify via points either, they had a tough finish in Sakurima. Didn't didn't have a usable finish. And so there, while Sophie and Heather are just, I mean, moonshotting, uh, Pavin and Molly are kind of in a holding pattern. So that race is getting absolutely fascinating. And what impressed me most about the, it's not just that Sophie and Heather are getting results, it's how they're getting their results. So Sophie in Recife sided out at 63%, led the tournament in blocks. Heather led the tournament in digs and aces. And so again, defense travels. You got one of the best defensive teams in Laura Ludwig, Louisa Littman, they get a silver medal. You get the best defensive team in the tournament in Recife, they get a silver medal. And so Sophie and Heather are playing fantastic volleyball. They sided out at 56%, held teams to a 42% side out. So if you have a 14% gap between your side out and theirs, that is a winning solution. And it's working out for Sophie and Heather. And now on to the final couple storylines for the women. Monica Polakine and Ayn Roplite, one of my favorite teams to watch. Monica is a gem. They take a bronze medal in Recife, and that's the first medal that they've won in challenge. You could see how much it meant to Monica as, as the phenomenal MC in Brazil. Just brings all of the energy. He says, Monica, what does this mean to you? She says, these are my kids here. All I got is obrigado, Brazil. Thank you, Brazil. So Monica and Einra Polite, they now have 6,480 points and are number 21 in the Olympic rankings I like their chances to make it, but again, they went back into the qualifier in Sakurima, didn't make it out. It's just these qualifiers are gnarly. Um, the Swiss women's race, it was also it was so great to see, to be in person and to see so many of these players that I, I commentate all the time and I podcast about all the time. Like I, I It feels like I've commentated about 200 of Zoe, Verge Dupre, and Esme Bobner's matches, but I'd never actually met him in person. And so we're in the gym, finally get to see him, introduce myself, hang out. So it's just good to see all these players in person again. Zach, Zach Schubert and Thomas Hodges got dinner with them and just staying next to Ludwig and Lippmann in the Airbnb, chatting with them every day. It's just good to get a vibe for the world tour, just in person and see everybody. But the Swiss women's race, pretty much no blood drawn. Zoe and Esme, they take a fifth in Recife while... Anouk and Joanna take a ninth, and then they just flip it. So Anouk and Joanna take a fifth in Sakurima. Zoe and Esme take a ninth. I do want to uh, shout out Zoe and Esme that the mental fortitude they showed to take that fifth in Recife was impressive because they lost their first round of pool. Zoe had a swing for the match against Agatha and Rebecca in the second round. That's night match in Brazil against Brazil. These are tough conditions. And Zoe hits this line shot just wide. They end up losing that second set. And a young team like Zoe and Esme, a lot of times you could see them just fold, especially when you're playing a legend in Agatha and veterans in Agatha and Rebecca. But they come back, they win that third set. They take a fifth, really good finish, really nice mental toughness shown by the young Swiss. So that race is just kind of in a the fascinating holding 
pattern that it is. And now for some last minute housekeeping. Uh, a lot of people were asking, what is up with all of the forfeits? So in Recife, I believe there were two women's forfeits and maybe three men's forfeits in the second round of pool play. And in Sakurima, it was the full sweep. Not a single men's winner's round of pool played their second match. And I explained this in Haiku. I'll just run over it again. So when you win your first round of pool in a 2014 main draw and it's modified pool, your second match doesn't, there's no incentive to play it. Whether you win or lose, you're starting the first round of playoffs in the ninth place rounds. And so when you got a tournament that's 100 plus degrees in Recife, why would you play it? And a lot of people are coming to the, to that conclusion, as you can see, and there's just there's no winning there. For young teams, I get you'd want the experience, you'd want the matches, you'd want the reps at the high level, but a lot of these teams are veterans, and there's just no sense in crushing your legs for no real incentive. If, and if you win, cool, you, you added a win to the resume, but it doesn't give you an advantage for where you're starting. And so teams have just picked up on that. Uh, the French women's race, that was really interesting that Aileen Chamro and Clemens Vieira, they forfeited their first round of pool against Lausanne Placet and Alexia Richard because if Lausanne and Alexia, if they end up qualifying via points, which they're likely to do so, then the wild card will supposedly, I would think, would go to Francis Tues, which would be Aileen and Clements. Now, I think one of them did have a flu. A lot of people got sick in Sakurima, and so the forfeit was pretty legitimate. I mean, all the forfeits are legitimate. In order to forfeit, you have to get checked out by a medical provider. He has to say, yep, he's unable to play, and then to and re-enter the tournament, that same medical provider has to say, you're good to play again. And so you do need actually legit excuses to forfeit. Uh, next up is quite the stretch. So four straight weeks of tournaments. I will be in Guadalajara for a challenge. We are bringing Frito, so we're going to have some fun content coming from that. Uh, then there is the Tepic Elite 16. I'll be back on the mic for that one. Then we are going to Xiamen for a challenge. And then from Xiamen, it's going to go to a Elite 16 in Brasilia. Brazil, and I'll be back on the mic for that. So I'll be in person for Guadalajara, on the mic for Tepic, in person for Xiamen, on the mic for Brasilia. It is so good to be back with my producers, one and two, especially producer two. He got a lot of uh, camera time today. Thanks, everyone, for hanging out on the road to Paris. Let me know any questions you have, any comments, whatever it may be. Let me know what kind of content you want from Frito from Guadalajara. Uh, we're hoping to do a lot more stuff like that. And uh, I'm going to get some sleep. Shoots.